a uh, <clears throat> little Johnny, uh, his uh, brother had been baptized that morning and they were on their way home. And as they're driving on the way home, little Johnny is just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing and crying. And his father asked him, said, son, what's the matter? No answer. Asked, son, what's the matter? No answer. Son, what's the matter? Didn't you, weren't you happy that your brother was baptized today? He said, oh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that, that my brother was baptized. He says, well, well what's the problem then? He, he said, well, he said the, the preacher said that he wanted to see that we were brought up in a Christian home. And he said, but I want to stay here with y'all. <laughs> we always have to watch out what our kids say when they're not with us, and even when they're with us sometimes. Title of the message this morning is, Get Ready, Jesus is Coming. And we're going to look in Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 25, and then verses 57 through 66. Now, only Luke <clears throat> tells about the prophecies of the coming of John the Baptist and about his birth. Why? Well, it could be because... Uh, Luke didn't want to miss anything that was really important because he was, he was one who wrote about details sometimes. And so he wanted to make sure that all the details around the birth of Jesus Christ were there and were told about. Or perhaps it was because of the audience because li that Luke was writing to. He was writing to Theophilus, and Theophilus is a Gentile word, and it meant friend of God. And so he could have been writing to one friend of God or he could have been writing to every friend of God uh, that was among the Gentiles. Now, since it means friend of God, we can understand that these people trusted and believed God. So now John is, uh, not John, Luke is writing to them and he's writing to them about John the Baptist. Now, we really don't know for sure why he wrote about it. But it's enough to know that he did. And it's enough to know that he tells us these events in John's life, and we want to look at them this morning. So let's look at Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well on in years. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, he was serving as priest before God. He was chosen by Lot according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will, be, will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and in power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well on in years. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. 
And I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. And we skip down to verse 58. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he's to be called John. They said to her, There's no one among our relatives who has that name. When they made signs to his father to find out what he would like the child to be named, he asked for a writing tablet. And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed and began to speak praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe and throughout the hill country of Judea, People were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand is with him. Now the heart of this message about John the Baptist's birth is, Get ready! Jesus is coming. And the message begins with a predicament. <clears throat> There's a difficulty here. And it lies in the belief that what? That this couple could not have any children. Why? Because of sin in their life. Sin. You know, that was the way they looked at it. Either the husband or the wife had sinned. But of course, usually the shame fell on who? It fell on the woman. And we see that Elizabeth felt that shame. She was the one who bore the disgrace. Now, this belief was similar to the belief that was expressed in the book of Job. His friends were convinced that Job's troubles were caused by some sin in his life. So they systematically tried to uncover that sin. But there was no sin in Job's life. Not that caused his problems. And similarly, there was no sin in Zechariah or in Elizabeth's life that caused their lack of a child. Instead, in this particular case, her barrenness allowed for the glory of God to be displayed in their lives. In other words, God was going to perform a miracle because it was a miracle. They couldn't have kids. Too old. Too old. Beyond the childbearing age. Her womb was all dried up and he was all dried up. But guess what? They did have a child. Miracle of God. Now later, God's favor permitted Elizabeth to proclaim that the Lord God had taken away her disgrace from among the people. Now, Luke, we know, corrected that false assumption that sin caused her barrenness. And he did that in verse 6. He says, Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. They were blameless. No sin in their lives. 
So it was for the glory of God. The glory of God. So let's move on from the predicament to the promise and the sign. And the sign, that is. In verse 13, Zechariah saw an angel who promised him that he'd have a son and told him to name him John. And the angel told him, he says, Listen, your son is going to be a joy and a delight to you. And the angel also said that many would rejoice at his birth and that he would be great in the sight of the Lord. Also, that he would bring many back to the Lord. Yes, understand this. John would hold a revival for two years. Two-year revival. <clears throat> now, John was a prophet of God. And perhaps the greatest revival speaker that Israel ever knew. He was. He was. But this wasn't the end in itself. It was just preparation. Preparation for the coming of the Lord. You know, Zechariah He, uh, he heard, but he couldn't believe. Have you ever heard something you couldn't believe? Have you ever heard of that? He couldn't believe it because his, uh, of his age. Because of his wife's age. They were just too old to have children. Or so they thought. And as a consequence of his doubting, Zechariah would not be able to speak until the child was born and named. Now maybe this was punishment for unbelief, but more than that, it was a sign. A sign. <coughs> a sign not only to Zechariah and Elizabeth, but a sign to the people. And a sign for us today. Those that were there saw him when he came out of the temple. They saw the sign. He could not speak. And those that were there when the boy was eight days old and when he was circumcised, all the relatives and friends that had gathered they gathered there to name him also at the same time. And they ask, or they said, you know how relatives are? Let's name him Zechariah. Elizabeth said, no way. We're going to name him John. <clears throat> well, they didn't like that. You know how relatives are. And it must have been his relatives. Because they didn't pay any attention to Elizabeth at all. Instead, they went and asked Zechariah says, Zechariah, what are we going to name him? And Zechariah asked for some writing, ta for a writing tablet, and something to write with. And he wrote down, his name is John. And the minute he wrote it down, he began to speak. And not only speak, but he began to praise God. To really praise God. He did. Now, of course, that was a surprise to all the people, but it was also a sign, a sign. And it was effective because it got the people's attention, and they wondered, they wondered, hey, I see this. This is a great miracle. This is fantastic. What is going to happen to this child? What is he going to become? What does the future have in store for him? And so we, we see that the, that's the question. The question. What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. Now listen, John, John was a Levite. 
Just like his father and his mother. John was also of the family of Aaron, which meant that he was a priest. And his father served at the temple. And when his time came, when he would be about 30 years old, normally John would go to serve at the temple. He would serve as a priest. But they see something more than that. When they see this sign, oh yeah, he's going to be a priest, but he's going to be more than that. What is he going to be? Let's keep our eye on this fellow. And they did. And they did. You know, it says in verses 16 and 17, Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will be go before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So he had a couple of jobs that he was going to do. One was to go out and preach and turn people back to God. <coughs> If there was probably anything that was going on in Israel at this time that showed that there was a great need, great need for revival was the fact of the materialism of Jerusalem that was going on in that day and time. Even the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and the Sadducees, the priests, they were some of the most materialistic people that there were. The people were that way. All they could think about was things. And they failed to see the spiritual things that were really important. They failed to see their own need for God. We could say that about much of our own nation today. People just do not see their need for God. They didn't. And so John came to call him back. And John introduces something new, something totally new. Now, some ha have written and tried to claim that the Pharisees had uh, various uh, washings and cleansings and, and, and baptisms that they had done, but not before Christ. They did some washings, yes. They washed the silverware, they washed their hands, they washed those things. And those were symbols of cleansing. But John's coming with something completely new here. John is coming preaching a baptism for repentance. You need to repent, he told them. And in fact, he even, he even spoke to them. He said, you brood of vipers. Who told you to come here? He knew who they were. And of course he made that especially apply to the Pharisees and some of those who came. You brood of vipers. And he told them, he said, listen, this, this repentance, it's not just saying I'm sorry. That's not what it's about. It's about a total lifestyle change. That's what this repentance is about. Total lifestyle change. And you need to make it. You need to make it. He said, look. Don't even think about relying on your heritage anymore. Don't even say that you're a child of Abraham. That's not going to get it. It doesn't mean anything except for the heritage that you have that you should be upholding, and you're not doing it. You're not doing it. They had to change their lifestyles. They had to live a life of doing what was right and good in the sight of the Lord. You see, this baptism was a washing away of their sins. It was a baptism for what? 
It was a baptism for the forgiveness of sin. That's what it specifically states and says. Baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. You need your sins washed away. And you need to rise in a newness of life to live for God. And that's what John came preaching. And John also warned them about the wrath that was coming. And he told them how to avoid it. He told them how to avoid it. Nevertheless, this was all in preparation for the coming of the Lord. Yeah, John did a mighty work for God. But all in preparation for the King of Glory. You know, in ancient times, soldiers and workers, they went out before the king when he was going to take a little trip. And they moved all the rocks out of the way. They straightened the crooked roads. They made them level so that you didn't have to go up and down mountains and through valleys and everything else. Listen, it was a major work. that they had to do to get a level place for the king to go because the king didn't want to be jostled when he was carried you've seen those pictures of those things that they that they get in this little um, cubicle I guess you'd call it and they have poles on each end and they pick it up and they carry it well that's what the what kings rode in oftentimes and so it was, for those great kings, they sent out men to straighten the roads. But that was the physical roads. The physical roads. John. John came to make a road. To make a road for the coming king, Jesus. But it wasn't a physical road. It wasn't a physical road. It was a spiritual road. <clears throat> so he called the people to repentance in preparation for Jesus Christ. For Jesus, who would die on the cross so that the repentant would be forgiven. Too many times... I turn on television and I hear preachers preaching and, and they're preaching an awful cheap, small-minded, mediocre grace. It's a, like all you have to do, touch the TV and you're saved. I don't know where it comes from. It sure wasn't in scripture because they didn't have TVs back then. <laughs> The point is, is that there's no forgiveness of sin without repentance. Not without repentance. And repentance is all about change. And, and, and that picture of baptism is all what it is. You go down the old man of sin. You rise up to a newness of life to live for Jesus Christ. And that's what it was all about. Having your sins forgiven so that you could escape the wrath to come and live and reign with God forever. That's what John came preaching. And John came preparing people for Jesus Christ. And what happened when Jesus came? Jesus was baptized by John. Now, of course, John recognized the fact. He looked at Jesus and he said, Hey, we're getting this wrong here. I don't need to be baptizing you. You need to be baptizing me. But Jesus said, No, we're going to do this to fulfill all righteousness. We're going to cross all the T's and dot all the I's 
And it's all going to be done right. All going to be done right. Christmas is just around the corner. And whatever else Christmas has become, <clears throat> it is still that reminder that John came and said, Jesus is coming. Prepare your hearts for the Lord. Christmas is that reminder of Jesus' first coming and is also a reminder of the promise of his second coming. You know, the whole season is a time of thanksgiving, a time of joy. It's a time of rejoicing, not just because of physical presence, but more so because of the physical present that John came to prepare the way for. And that spiritual present is Jesus Christ, our Savior, God's Son, who died on the cross to save us from our sins. And that's not light. And that's not to be taken lightly. He died for you. He died for me. I can't think of it in any light terms. Can't think of it in some way of what's the least I can do to get by. No. He died for us so that we can have the forgiveness of sin. At least the repentant can. That spiritual present, Jesus, is what Christmas is all about. He died for our sins and he rose from the dead, giving us the hope of our own resurrection. So John came to do what? To prepare us for Jesus. He came also to turn people back at that time. To call people to revival. To call people to say, come, I want to serve the Lord. I want to do away with all this materialism. He didn't call people to sell everything they had and give it away and become poor. He called people to come and change their heart. To change what's important in your life. What's important should be the spiritual. We have a hope of our own resurrection because of our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ because we have been repentant and we have had our sins forgiven. John came to prepare us for Jesus. So the question is, have you repented of your sin? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life? Have you been buried with him in baptism? Are you ready for Jesus' coming again? It's time to get ready. Because he's coming. And that's John's message. It was for then and it's for now. And it has been the message of the church through the ages Jesus is coming. And that's what Christmas is all about. So get ready. Jesus is coming. Now we're going to have an invitation hymn. And if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and your Savior, if you haven't repented of your sins and had your sins washed away, we want to invite you to come and do that as we stand and as we sing this invitation hymn. Invitation song number 404. I surrender all. Let us stand as we sing, please.